we got 160 slides to get through. We're doing them all. I feel like if I get through the intro ones that don't really matter for the content, we, <laughs> we might save a minute. It might be a good idea. I don't know. Yesterday I had about 45 slides. And then I went to speaker jail, AKA the hotel. Didn't even go to the party. I've concluded I cannot write a talk without the pressure. All right. I will do the nonsense slides and then people can still be sitting. Don't worry about interrupting that at all. Uh, Kotlin Mill for Teens, uh, ready for production. I'm just stating that because I've been saying that for several years. Hopefully you start to believe us. Uh, welcome to Kotlin Church. I really appreciate the marketing people from Touch Lab taking this awesome photo and making a joke for the old school Joy-Con people. Uh, this guy commented on there and called it Kotlin Church, so welcome. Uh, introduction. My name is Kevin Galligan, the founder and technical partner of Touch Lab, Kotlin GDE, uh, Touch Lab, and Kotlin Mobile. Let me give you a little background of what we've been doing. So, uh, prehistory was J2WJC. We had Room working on iOS in 2016. There was one app in the App Store for Pizza Hut that has that, and that's it. Then, we realized no one thought that was cool. iOS native uh, for Kotlin emerged in 2017. We almost had DroidCon San Francisco working. Jeff Rains beat us by about two weeks for uh, Kotlin Conf in 2017, but that's okay. Uh, we had the first production apps going out in 2018 from us. We fully dedicated K to KMP as Touch Lab in 2018. Directly built several apps. We commercially advised several small to large companies over the last few years, and we've community advised an order of magnitude more than that, advised being a loose term, of course. The primary observation that seems very obvious to throw away from the beginning, but is very important once you can begin to really understand it, and I'm constantly reminded of this, is different teams have different approaches to this, right? And it, it sounds like a throwaway thing, but it's very important when you start to think about how you're going to use Kotlin multi-platform. So I have this mental model that I've been working on, and through the course of these slides, I'm going to reevaluate it when I get home, but we're going to go with what we got today. I'll do my best. There are different modes of development, and I kind of bucket them different ways. It is sort of a complexity sophistication model, but don't think of them too linearly because just because you're mode one does not mean that you're lacking of mode two. It depends on who you are again. So mode one is shared module, AKA SDK flow. This is very simple to understand. You have some, let's say Android code, and then you want to do some shared code, and that may be in the same repo or a separate repo, but you have some shared Kotlin. That Kotlin gets wrapped into an Xcode framework and almost certainly put somewhere on a cloud for your iOS developers to consume. Sometimes, again, the Kotlin code is in the Android module and it's a project dependency. Sometimes it's in a separate module. Sometimes for political reasons, it's in a separate module so nobody feels like the stepchild. That's an interesting discussion. Anyway, uh, this is the first step and also a rather complex step for any individual developer. You need production understanding of Android configuration, iOS configuration, Kotlin multi-platform configuration experience and how all those things mix together. That means a lot of points of failure, right? This is why Cambridge exists. Uh, it's KMM bridge, but you know, whatever rolls off the tongue. That's basically what this thing does. Mode two is I call shared architecture. Uh, I have individual and smaller teams, but you know, don't get that too literally. Smaller teams can be feature teams inside large orgs. Individuals might publish SDKs. Who knows what they're going to do? But the summary is everyone builds Kotlin locally on your machine, and that's how you consume it. This is the stock tooling that comes with KMP. Um, vast majority of docs and tutorials cover this thing. And as we get into the more production phase of this technology, that will change. That's why you're here right now. So um, pros and cons. Everybody gets exposed to Kotlin if you build locally. That's a good thing. You become, you start sharing code and ideas and everyone gets along sometimes. Um, you can more easily edit and debug, right? You can see what's going on. I'm an Xcode, but I can see what's happening in the Kotlin. Um, more shared code, like up to the screen, architecture, uh, more efficiencies, that all sounds great. However, I will tell you this from experience. Many OIS teams do not want to start the experiment that way. Uh, this can have a significant impact, a negative impact on your iOS tooling. You get people who are just like, I don't want this, blah, blah, blah. And um, feature dev gets harder to coordinate as teams grow. We will talk about that more pretty soon. Mode three, which I call optionally shared UI TM. Spoiler, it's not trademarked, but I get funny in the hotel with slides. 
Um, I'm going to call back to something just to sort of like set a record straight, which is not really set in record straight. But this is a slide I had from 2018 when I was first talking about KMP, copying a slide from decades ago talking about Java. And the point about this one was like, remember when they said write once, run anywhere if you're old enough? Ha ha ha, we're not all running Java apps, shared UI, what a failure. But if you call Java a failure, you're out of your mind. It is all over the place, right? So shared logic is the history of the computers. It's a nice little quote. We put it on slides. I put it on slides. People remember that. John O'Reilly called me last year. I was like, wait a second. It's not quite what I meant. Somebody yesterday was like, oh, what do you think about Compose UI? Not somebody, but I'm, I'm only calling out people who publicly said things. Um, and what do you think about Compose UI? I must hate it. I think you hated shared UI. And I'm like, no, even in that same talk, I want to be clear. Not necessarily, not UI, but not necessarily UI, right? Even then, before Compose on iOS was a, a dream in anyone's mind, uh, of course, there's going to be shared UI options. There are going to be specific cases. There are going to be form builders. There's going to be this and that. You know, at the time, there were people trying to do stuff, and we saw demos and whatever. And it, it's a much harder problem than I think small individuals really understand. So building it as a small team is going to be brutal. But there are going to be options eventually, right? So nothing is prime time yet. I made these slides before the keynote yesterday. Then there was the keynote yesterday. So depending on your definition of prime time, Compose is an alpha. That's cool. I don't know if it's prime time for you. It's probably not. We'll have to see how it goes. Um, we did Compose UI and iOS for a DroidCon app last year. I am almost certain that was the first one in the App Store. I'm surprised that that ran into no problems going to the App Store uh, and it was out there. It was not exactly what you'd call great or fast, but that was eight months ago. And we've been very busy on other things. <laughs> I'm really excited to go home and try DroidCon with the updated Compose UI. And I know a bunch of other folks, John O'Reilly included, are doing this stuff. And I, I think I've sold him on the idea that this might be good. Um, not that he needs selling. But you know what I'm saying. Anyway, and does it matter for first? No, nobody cares, but I like to know that. Anyway, um, other examples of shared UI. So a little bit later, Jake is giving a talk about Redwood and Treehouse. Not everyone these days is a hardcore Android developer, so that is Jake Wharton. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't need to introduce who he is. Uh, this is definitely shared UI. All the focus is really on over-the-air updates, which is wild if you think about it using Kotlin.js, hopefully in the future WASM. Um, it is a composed DSL representing your abstract design system, kind of, that then gets rendered on the native platforms that can be updated remotely. It is wild. Um, we have been working on something that's essentially the same thing minus the remote magic and just kind of a composed language that can do Swift UI and iOS and do Compose UI on Android, uh, a simplified thing. We have a non-marketing friendly term, which I wasn't going to share, but it's funny. It's called Louis, lowest common denominator UI. We'll come up with something better if we ever release it. Uh, but we might not, depending on how fast Compose UI and how well it's implemented and how fast it emerges, it might not be a point. But we'll see. The performance is amazingly great. Like, it scrolls huge list and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, this stuff is coming. So, um, what's optionally, right? And this is a, a concept I want to get across very importantly, because I, I, I very clearly said I think it's very important for the near future. Um, it's, it's kind of an 80-20 rule, and I'm still working on terms here. But if you think about it, somebody using your app, or when you use anyone's app, you spend 80% of the time or more in a couple of main screens and 20% of the time or less in a bunch of the other shit, right? And I mean shit, you know, affectionately, but it's just the other stuff, right? Uh, here's a classic example that I put on the blog post. Well, I'm going to at some point, unless Apple gets upset. Uh, Apple Health, and on the left is their main feed. And if you think that screen didn't have teams of people spending many, many hours making that thing perfect, I think you're gonna be wrong. I don't work at Apple, I don't know. And if someone told me that actually the setting screen took a lot of work, I would call, tell them they're full of shit, right? Like, it's pretty generic. Now, you can imagine that spread large to a large app and think about what, what that implies. I'm also amazed during at the hotel how much they talk about alcohol consumption in here. But we'll talk about that later when we're consuming alcohol. I skipped the party last night because I had to write slides. So um, the other thing I think I need to remind people of, which I, it's often glossed over, and talking about comparing other tools. Like Android is not cross-platform, right? Kotlin is the default language. Compose UI is the default UI soon, hopefully. So there's nothing cross-platform about the Android side, right? On the iOS side, if you can get almost all of your code to be shared and only really focus on the UI of, of this very, very important bit that talks to shared architecture, I think that that's an amazing feature that's coming very, very soon and it's something that we have to figure out. Um, can you do this with other tech? Sure. But the definition of possible and designed for are not the same thing. You could code your apps in assembler, but I would not recommend it. So, I know, it's an example. I try to be funny. Let me try to be less funny. I'll just go through my slides. So, uh, 
I don't know. I found German audiences are less apt to jokes. Maybe they don't understand my jokes. But that's a sweeping generalization when I talk in Berlin. Less jokes usually. Okay. Um, we're very excited about this. There's lots to figure out. Architectural libraries, navigation. Like there's lots to figure out still about how reactive, uh, you know, UIs are going to work with like what we classically consider view models and all this kind of stuff. And there's all these different opinions. Well, multiply that by you might be using Swift UI or you might not. These are things to figure out. But those are the problems that the community can really, you know, noodle on and have conference talks and just get all crazy about. We can do the open source stuff to do that. The fact that JetBrains is committed to doing the UI and making it good is very exciting. And we should all support them and or heckle them and push them to do a little further and test it and everything else. So, um, shared, not heckle, the wrong word. Shared UI is hard, um, but if it's done well, you know, uh, we had this interesting conversation this morning. And again, I don't, you can't talk about someone who hasn't posted it publicly, but it was like, we're like, what's native? And, and finally you whittle it down and it's like, native to a, a user is when they can't tell that it's not. So we're gonna see how this goes, right? The phones get better, the technology gets better. Maybe one day, you know, things will, whatever. Um, so this is a quote I wanna get out there. I need to condense it a little bit, but optionally should UI is a better cross-platform. And if successful, this will be a default option in a year, I'm hoping. Talk to me in a year and tell me how I was wrong. Anyway, uh, this happened yesterday, I was very excited. And, and you know, um, I, I would say as you get into like, I spent a lot of time as an open source only person and doing the good stuff. And then you start getting the business and the business concerns and blah, 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 blah. And it, it starts to take away like the fun of things. And I'm sure that there's a lot of reasons that people get involved with foundations and talk and it's all business and angles and whatever. Um, but I will tell you that I, I got into Kotlin not because I thought it was a better business option than whatever. I got into Kotlin because uh, I'm a bit obsessed with this tech and better tech. And I don't think you can really get into something and make it better if you're not a bit obsessed. The fact that we're now have some small seat at this foundation table to hopefully bend the future towards what I think is a better future and get to watch that thing happen, I am beyond excited. So let's see if we can do that and move the industry forward. And more on the future later in the future of this talk, if we're gonna get meta. So uh, the final mode is shared everything and it's kind of a letdown. We're not gonna talk about it much because it's basically Flutter. Um, not that this won't be a thing. Uh, and it could be great with Kotlin. I mean, it could be great with Flutter, I don't know. But, um, but it'll be a while before you can really put those next to each other and get the same dev experience and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and, and we as a company are focused on you know, the, the, the optional thing. Um, Compose UI and tooling will make this possible. But even funny, if you're like, I'm gonna build my whole app with shared Compose. There's something about the fact that if you decide that that screen isn't quite cutting it, that that's okay, and you can slice it out and do something better, that's a much less risky proposition for the decision makers and you as an individual and you and your orgs. And as the orgs get bigger, the decisions get more problematic. So is this a zero sum game? Flutter versus whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, just to warn you, these are not remotely scientific. These are charts that I made and I made them for a talk last year. So some of the dates are a little off. But uh, we started Touch Lab in about 2010. 2014 was our first Droidcon in New York, and uh, we were running that, and we were doing a bunch of community stuff before then, but I would say that's when we went like wide scale with community. And if you walked around on that floor and said, hey, what do you do? Who do you work for? You'll get, I work for this little startup that's building this crazy app, or one guy I know, he's like, well, it's my side hustle. I bought a Tesla with the app I put in the store. Like amazing stories. Uh, if you come here, like this thing starts to shift over time. I would even say 2016 was almost this moment of crisis for small app dev shops. It was less, it was the, the, the nature of the requests for coming in were larger companies and different things. And fast forward to 2022, or in this case now, 2023, if you go to DroidCon and you're on the floor and you're, hey, what do you do? You won't, like, I would be shocked if someone said I bought a Tesla with my side hustle. You're going to say I work at Uber or whatever. It's much more likely that you're going to work at a big place. I would say there are not less native mobile jobs in 2022. I would say in 2023, there are not proportionally less native mobile jobs. We all just went through some bad times in the tech world, but I think it was kind of even across the board, unless you're an AI expert. Um, but the consolidation of those jobs has gone all the way to these big AAA apps. Like the, the big apps have much more sophisticated tools, much more sophisticated teams, larger teams doing stuff. The startups are not out there making native apps. I call this the boring middle, also not a good marketing term if you're trying to sell stuff, but this is enterprise apps. These are startups that are building something where the app is not the product. If you're building a fitness app, maybe it's gonna be completely native. If you're building a smart share, 
that you want to connect to Bluetooth and do some analytics or some bullshit, it's probably not going to be fully native on both platforms, although Bluetooth is a bad example because it might need to be, but that's a different discussion. This is where this market's already moved. Like, they're not going out and hiring native developers. You might be like, hey, Kevin, you're wrong. I work for one of these companies. Like, yeah, it, it's a generality, right? Some companies are hiring native dev to do shit that could easily be a web, and some companies that absolutely should be making native apps are using React Native, right? Um, but generally speaking, I think that this is self-evident if you're paying attention to the community. Now, 2026, is it going to go this far? Is native go away? Does it stay where it is? I don't know. If I was good at predicting the future, I would be calling you from my private island. I'm pretty good at predicting some future things. But I can tell you one thing. This chart does not go the other direction, ever. Even if it stops, this whole world is going to be mostly whatever you think cross-platform is. And if you don't hear about it much, it's because the people that are doing it aren't talking to you. <laughs> like, they're doing other shit. So, that's my prognostication. We'll get out of that. So, I don't think it's zero-sum Colin versus Flutter. I definitely think it's Kotlin, Flutter, React Native, whatever the hell versus native. And it's not necessarily a battle to the death. We're just going to see where things land. And there's not too much we can control in that world. But we'll see how it goes. So enough about that. Let's talk about specific things, integration approaches. So we had a workshop on Wednesday, which is partially why I was in speaker jail yesterday doing my slides when I couldn't be at the party. I was super behind. But at the workshop, one of the questions we got right out of the gate was, how do you integrate Kotlin iOS into a team? And of course, does anyone want to guess what the answer is? It depends. Thank you. Thank God. I didn't know how that was going to go. Wish you had said it louder, but I thank you. I made a little meme. Say it, developer. It depends. <laughs> Always the answer, of course, right? Well, it depends on what? It depends on a lot of things. Team size, repo organization, KMP experience, iOS team acceptance. Spoiler, not everyone is jazzed about this prospect. Um, tooling, of course, time. Next year is going to be a different answer than last year, five years from now. I don't know. Just tell ChatGPT to do it, and hopefully that they won't hurt you on the way to finishing your work. Um, those are examples. Those are other factors. Again, it all depends, right? Uh, smaller teams, generally more flexible. You can kind of rip the Band-Aid off. You're like, hey, it's Friday afternoon, Monday morning. We're going to have a completely different CI setup. And you're like, okay. Sure, whatever, we'll figure it out. Less institutional inertia. If you have one iOS engineer, one Android engineer, and the back-end person kind of helps a bit, like when you're having lunch on Zoom, the iOS engineer can't be like, screw you, we're not even going to look at this. It's a little more friendly, generally speaking, not always, uh, and generally more tolerant to like, the issues that come up when you're doing this new stuff. Like They'll just kind of deal with it. So I would say, generally speaking, you can do the, the shared SDK, and you can experiment with the other modes, and it's kind of possible. Uh, larger teams have different sort of issues. Right? There's more coordination problems. Uh, they're more risk averse, more inertia, for good reasons. Like if you said, hey, uh, 38 engineers Monday morning, the CI is going to be completely different. And they come in and it doesn't work. Like you might not be there a lot longer if you made that decision. Um, specialized dev focus. Not everyone is tinkering with the database and looking at the back end. Some people are just making sure that scroll doesn't lag. So is a different situation. There's more politically entrenched. Now, if you have 20 iOS engineers, I guarantee you it's going to be a lot easier for them to get together and say, you know what, screw this, we're not doing it now. And they're going to push back, and you're going to need to be ready for that stuff, right? I would say mode one to start, and maybe forever, and this is where the linearity comes in. That's not a bad thing, um, if you get anything at all. New apps, fresh start. You pick an architecture. What kind of CI do you want? Anything you need. Mono repo. why wouldn't you? Brand new app, do whatever you want, more flexible on options. Yes, that's my dog. Existing apps, lots of existing code. Maybe multiple repos. CI is robust, aka complex to change. Um, existing procedures, existing test coverage, lack thereof. By the way, really briefly, I said no more jokes, but a small one. When we got the young dog, I was like, I'm going to be the perfect dog parent, and this dog is going to be so trained, he's going to be amazing. He's going to be well-behaved, he's going to eat right, he'll do basic math, wonder dog. <laughs> a few months later, I'm like, he's never bitten anybody and he poops outside. That's great. My dog does not want to hear about your goddamn cross-platform solutions. So, everybody can do mode one, right? Versioned SDK pros, minimally disruptive to the iOS team, no extra tooling, don't need to learn Kotlin. Uh, you can start small, prove the technology, versioned SDK, unlikely to break your builds without you being prepared for it. Um, cons, 
limiting to sharing efficiency, right? If you've got this little module over here that's being built by some special hands, it's very hard to say, I want to do a view model over here now by the iOS team. That just doesn't happen. Um, the iOS team never really gets ownership if they're not led or you don't have really curious people to go check it out. Um, slow feature and bug fix cycle. Hey, this isn't working. Okay, you got to wait a whole sprint maybe or whatever the hell, however you're doing things. Uh, and it's something I call the unwelcome guest. And it is, as you can imagine, I added this Kotlin shit and then I did some things and now my app crashes. You broke my app and you send it back. And they come back and said, no, it's fine. Okay, well, okay, I see it, but you broke it again. Something's wrong. No, we didn't change anything. Please fix that thing, right? It always gets blamed for a thing, especially if it's a black box and double, especially if they weren't on board with the plan to begin with. Uh, I have a long story about a client. I won't get into, well, all right, briefly. Big client, we're making a little SDK and sharing it with internal parts of the org. And the first one has not, wants, doesn't even know who we are, wants nothing to do with this. They put the thing in, they come back immediately and say, hey, it's crashing, you gotta fix it. And I looked at the logs and I'm like, it, you're calling it in the wrong order. You got some weird threading issues. So like, absolutely not, we followed your docs. All right, a couple weeks later, I'm like, hey, we fixed it. They're like, it's still crashing. I'm like, yeah, I know. All I did was add more logs. See, you're calling it wrong. And then they fixed it. Like, it was more polite than that. You don't want to just call people out to their face, but like, essentially what happened. So, um, everybody, asterisk, not everybody, but everybody starts with mode one. Everybody comes with an SDK and says, let's try this out. Because it is um, the good thing to do. Many companies stay in that mode. Again, it's not linear. If you go watch last year at DroidCon New York, the Cash App team was talking about modularity of their app, not shared code, just their Android app. And they had a chart that was showing the velocity of new modules being added over the years. It was something like 800. If you're doing that just with your regular code, there's no reason why you shouldn't continue that with your shared code because your team is so big, you cannot be doing like crazy stuff all the way up the stack. Small teams is a different story or feature teams, yada, yada. Um, many, well, many stay there. I was ahead. Look at me, I'm not paying attention. So, uh, this is the first bit of concrete tooling, again, Cambridge. This is what we released it for, right? The stock tools from, for Kotlin are all local dev, right? But what do teams do, right? I've seen this movie last year again, DroidCon. Clearly I have a theme here. I spend time at DroidCon and then I don't go anywhere apparently. Um, Nate Ebel was giving a talk about Brownfield applications and I'm watching the talk and I'm like, oh my God, I know how this ends. I know the entire script because it's the same thing that most of the companies that we work with did. They try a local dev. The iOS team says, get the F out of here. They regroup. They're like, hey, we want a framework. Okay, they don't say they could just say, hey, just publish a framework, we'll try it out. Okay, well, what do you do with a framework? How do you make a framework? What's a framework? Well, let's put it in the repo because they don't know where to put it. I'm like, okay, but every commit's 50, 50 meg to 100 meg. And magically at some point, and I think the point is five gig, and I don't know why, but we've seen it multiple times. Xcode is just like, you know what? I've had enough of this shit. And it gets upset. So then the next thing you do is you have to go change git history, yank all this binary out of there. Now we gotta post it somewhere. Where do you post it? Artifactory. Why? I don't know. That's what Android people do. Like that is the same process that happens every damn time, roughly speaking. So, uh, and all of that is before you start, right? Like you haven't really done anything yet. So think about all the points of failure, or I would say more realistically, the points of scuttle. After a few tries and failures, the iOS folks very rightly are going to say, look, this is clearly not ready for production or we're not ready to use it in production. Let's revisit it in six months. And that statement goes on in a lot of companies four years. So um, Cambridge was part of a, something more ambitious, which we'll talk a little bit about later, depending on my time. We'll see how it goes. But uh, we took a knife out and said, like, everyone needs this. So we just cut it out, said, here you go. Uh, wide adoption needs SDK publishing for KMP for Teams. It just does. And... SPM. This is a message I'm going to say multiple times in this talk to JetBrains, to the community, everybody. Without SPM, we're not going to get real deep adoption in the iOS community. It needs to happen. So um, Cambridge publishes SP, uh, XE frameworks. That's SPM, Cocoa Pods, public or private, out of the box. You can set up your GitHub. It goes to GitHub packages. You almost have to do nothing, and this will push there. You can also do JetBrains space. Let's hear it for space. Uh, Try to be nice for the host. All right, Artifactory, whatever. Uh, you can use GitHub Enterprise. Um, what, and if you want something custom, you got to write it. You can do S3 buckets. That gets weird, though. Uh, and then, but also local dev. And I'll explain this in a second. Uh, closing the platform gap. Again, another trademark thing that's not trademark. I'm just kidding. Um, but the idea is that Cambridge also has this 
absolute necessary thing, which we call flip a switch, which essentially is trying to make platform engineers more into mobile engineers, right? So um, yes, you can consume remote frameworks, but you can also clone and build and debug them locally, uh, of course, if you have the Kotlin tools installed, which not every ISO engineer is going to do out of the box. But again, if you're getting more invested, it's not a huge lift. Um, I would say very briefly, briefly, can you build a remote framework and then also debug it locally without building it locally? It is possible. It was part of that big, bigger Cambridge thing I alluded to, but it is complicated and we just said, ah, screw it. But if you really want that, maybe we can talk. Um, so also very important, we have a very rudimentary but very functional local SPM dev flow baked into Cambridge. So you can, you have to use the, the Gradle CLI, but you can build a framework for a specific target and have a, a functional local SPM dev flow. Again, it would be great if this was first party support or official support. If anyone gets really, really excited about this, let's talk, you can add that to Cambridge or whatever, or do it yourself. Like we're happy to, to take features out if somebody does not better. So um, what happens after mode one for a team? And this is funny because the last couple of years, especially last six months leading up to this conference, I would reach out to people and I'd be like, how are you solving this problem with your big team? And you, you know, you're on the, the, the white papers and the, you're doing interviews about KMP. What are you doing? And they're like, oh crap, more than once. They're like, oh crap, I was gonna ask you that. Like, how do you get people to coordinate without stepping on each other, right? And uh, the, the short answer and the sad answer is like, there is no magic bullet, there's no magic answer, right? So um, everybody builds local. Uh, shared code is actually shared, right? Not versioned libraries, probably mono repo, God help you, sub modules, however you're doing it. That's what I'm talking about when we go past mode one. So the pros are less rigid. You are closer to feature dev. Like instead of waiting for an SDK with a version number, it's like, hey, I gotta add a checkbox that, it, that you say you accept the terms. I'm gonna add it to Android. I'm gonna push that out. That's awesome. You can share a lot more code. The cons, breaking the other platform. If you add that checkbox logic to the shared code and you don't bother to check iOS, the iOS is gonna run and you'll never be able to submit because there's no way to check the box because the box does not exist. That's the happy path. The sad path is you just crash. So uh, feature implementation must be in lockstep and all engineers kind of must be mobile engineers worrying about the other platform. And, and this is the thing, feature implementation must be in lockstep, which will be a recurring theme in some of this talk and, and in a lot of out in the world. So what's the secret? Again, taps the sign. There isn't one. That's unfortunate. What's the actual answer? Take another guess. There you go. We're going to do this one more time. So um, I actually will call out. It was uh, great to come to a conference because you start talking to people. And like, I wouldn't say all these ideas were like unique. Some of them actually were. But it was good to hear someone who understood these problems and was saying them back to me at a level or even beyond what we were talking about. So shout out to Mark if you're here. Um, I would say. Embrace breaking changes. Oh, I wasn't supposed to call people out that didn't publish the podcast. Sorry. Anyway, name's out there. Um, embrace breaking changes, right? Like, do have good tests, you know, fix things, try to do a good job. But if something breaks, that's not an excuse to stop doing shared code. You have to accept that this is going to happen. I have heard that from other folks, and it was just kind of really crystallized there. Um, all engineers must avoid a test and avoid breaking the other platform. Like you can't just commit. You got to do some extra stuff. You know, um, something that Mark did not like, which is something I suggested, and I think some teams can do if they like it. Tag team feature PR. So like I do the Android side. I add that button on the logic. PR is not done until someone who's focused on the iOS screens comes in and takes it over, finishes it, and commits it. I don't mind it. Not everyone's going to love it. Um, another thing was just, just pull versions and deal. Like if there's four. Ver four changes that were in the next version of, of the, the published framework and you're the iOS dev to you pull it in to do a fifth feature. Well, you got to do all the other four features too. That's life. Sorry to tell you something worked, and then something more complicated, which was getting into like what that big Cambridge thing was, which is actually being able to like mechanically pull change sets and do all this stuff. Uh, there might be a tool for that, but we stopped working on it because it was like, this is only for big companies and trying to imagine going to, again, say an Uber and say, hey, I know you have all these entrenched procedures. Why don't you take our weird thing we did in a vacuum and haven't really tested with anybody and put it in your production build? If you're wondering why we stopped, then I don't know what to tell you, but we stopped. Um, so after that, again, the distinction between public SDK and directly shared code, you know, they're broad generalizations. Like mode three, mode four, they're different than mode two. Like, I, I don't know. You can do shared UI with published SDKs too. But anyway, that's why I got to change the mental model a bit or at least make it more nuanced. Anyway, uh, something interesting from the, work, the workshop was, you know, somebody was like, you know, Flutter doesn't have this problem, you know, because you make a change and it's on both platforms. So in that way, it's easier. And I'm like, oh, that's true. And then I was thinking of the 
again, getting funny in the hotel, Schrodinger's code, like something changes you didn't know about and your app starts crashing, it's because someone changed the code underneath you. So you don't know what you're gonna get any given day. That is how I'm trying to, I'm, I'm testing out that, that phrase for the problem. So it is another win for optionally shared UI, which obviously needs another acronym. Again, I'm not a marketer. Um, if you're doing a lot of your shared UI, you kind of get that flutter stuff where you're not worried so much again about the shared code changing underneath you, but you do have to worry about it for the non-shared special UI code. So speeding up because we're going to be running out of time. The interop is a whole entirely separate problem. I have this big slide that I used to put up explaining why I think Kotlin's great. And there's way too much to unpack here and also involves JetBrains, which is important to have a good tooling company. But the important point here is that it's optionally shared. And the reason it's optionally shared is because the interop is so good. Like if you're gonna do C++, you can do the same things, but it's going to suck. That's why Dropbox stopped. So um, again, going back to this, another thing that Nate kind of crystallized was the developers are usually sort of Android focused and they're lacking in an understanding of what the interop is like, what these other things are going to look like to other people, right? So I say, hey, Kotlin iOS interop, it's amazing relative to other cross-platform technologies and languages. So amazing would probably not be the word everyone would use from the iOS side. It's objective C. iOS devs generally don't love objective C. It's not just, hey, we'd prefer it not to be objective C. There are like reasons they don't. They spent years isolating, cauterizing their objective C to have only Swift. Uh, Apple is moving towards Swift. So eventually Kotlin is definitely gonna have to be direct Swift interrupt. Uh, junior to mid-level iOS engineers either haven't done much or have never touched objective C. This is an issue that's in the real world, and it's going to be an issue when you're talking to people. Um, Kotlin goes through the Objective-C lens and winds up in Swift. A lot of that modern language expressiveness just gets ripped right off, which sucks. Um, and the Swift interop, uh, again, it's discussed and presumably coming, but even if we get direct Swift interop, it doesn't necessarily solve all the problems. Uh, I, there's a lot of blog posts about how similar Swift and Kotlin are. That is syntactically. They are very different languages under the hood. If you want to know how different, corner one of the JetBrains native team <laughs> and ask them, and you're going to get a lot of it. There you, there you go. Um, I'll give you a quick overview. Seal classes, yield names with associated values. Eh, you know, they're similar concept. Data classes, structs, conceptually similar. Generics, sure, but they're super different. Default parameters, yeah, but there's problems. Uncheck exceptions, why would you not check your exceptions? Uh, basic types, there's different things, and coroutines, async stuff. I mean, it's entirely separate ecosystems. They're very different. So um, we have to assume Objective-C is going to be with us for a while. And we assume that the code goes from Kotlin to Objective-C into Swift. So the situation today, in very quick summary, still classes are just classes. Data classes are just classes. Generics, no comment. Uh, <laughs> default parameters. Nope, coroutines, uh, kind of ish. I mean, technically flows are there, but I wouldn't call them directly. And um, continue. There's a bunch of other little stuff. You know, again, we're running out of time. So uh, the Kotlin sophistication journey, we've seen a lot of organizations do. Android engineers mostly code Kotlin. Um, they're like, hey, we're going to try this thing out. It's awesome. They don't quite grasp why the output is rough. And uh, work around output quirks over time, trying to make it better. Then they're incorporating more tools to try to improve stuff. Then maybe even handwriting wrappers. We've seen a lot of folks doing this. And maybe, maybe the rarest of rare, they're writing their own in-house tools to help generate things to help this interface be better. I call this collectively the API anxiety. The Android developers don't really know what the Kotlin's going to look like on the other side. The iOS developers are expecting this to not be great. And this is a training problem that everyone really should be investing time and money. And I'm not just saying that because I'm about to give you a pitch, but I am about to give you a pitch. Uh, you have to train appropriately and you have to get people ready if you're going to make that investment or it's going to be doing it the hard way. What's the hard way? Well, the easiest analogy is if you want to learn boxing the hard way, you just get in a ring and go for it without learning anything about foot position or punching or doing any workouts. It's kind of like you just go in and see what happens, right? It's not a very good time for a lot of folks and often results in failure. Um, so at pitch time, I like to be explicit. Uh, you know, I'm not really a salesperson at heart. So uh, we have this thing called Touch Lab Pro. Uh, again, velocity in a box. I just made it up in the hotel, not a marketer. But essentially it is like we have developed internal training materials with new folks. And we have clients that were like, well, we got to help you train and do these things. And we have these like weird one-off tools, like building remotely and debugging locally and all that kind of stuff and size measurement tools and all these things. And we're like, what some folks really need, like large orgs have velocity teams that only exist to make development better for their orgs. 
we are an outsourced version of that. And either, you know, you directly work with us or, hey, you can have access to our stuff. That is one thing. Talk to Jeff. I don't know if he's here, but you can find us, I assure you. Um, this other thing we are talking about today is this thing called Sky, Swift Kotlin Interface Extender or Enhancer. We'll decide when we get home. There seems to be confusion. And a lot of people are like, is that Ski? I'm going to help. No, Sky, Old English. It's a good name, I thought, or we thought. But hopefully it continues to be a good name. Anyway, what does it do? Sky takes enums from Kotlin, and on the Swift side, you get real Swift enums, uh, exhaustively checkable enums. And this happens automatically at the translation layer. It does steel classes in a, steel classes are hard to get right if you try to turn them into enums with associated values. So we have something that at first you're like, what's that? But it, it, it is definitely exhaustible, and it does what you would want, and it does that automatically too. Default parameters are back. Woohoo! Uh, the other thing it does that's very important is the reactive interface. You get suspend, uh, you get flows that turn into proper async sequences, you get auto cancellation, you get what you would expect on the Swift side from these, these structures. Somebody that's in the audience right here will explain it much better if you have specific questions. Uh, so I'll probably get something wrong and I'll be upset. But it also does things where it actually uses the same thread and then it does things, it does a lot of weird magic. And the other thing it does is it uses Kotlin IR instrumentation to do change the interface, but also generate Swift. And then it steps right into the Kotlin compiler sequence, compiles that Swift, links it directly back into the original framework. So your packaging does not change. And when nothing goes wrong, nothing ever goes wrong. Uh, when you put it in there, you can compile the app in the same way. You don't need to change anything, but you can start changing how you call stuff to be more Swift friendly over time. You can isolate it to specific packages, whatever you want to do. Is this open source and free? It is not. We're licensing TBD. It's a long discussion, politics of that, but it is uh, kind of targeted at larger orgs and the amount of work that went into it is, is kind of hard to like explain very quickly. Uh, as a sample, the test suite involves every public thing we could find from Kotlin, pulling it in and running it through this library to make sure it works every commit. And it's an enormous amount of work to make this all work right. So uh, we're doing demos at the remainder of this conference, which is rapidly running out of time, but please come get a demo and you can have a trial or just reach out. We'll get that to you uh, and whatever. And now I'm about to ensure a tense ride home on the plane and a tense Monday morning meeting because I'm going to talk about the alternatives that don't involve licensing anything from us briefly um, because there are. So the other one, the one I would have to mention, uh, if I didn't, I would be a humongous uh, a-hole, of course, is KMP native coroutines. I don't know if Rick is here. Well, he's not in this talk. Anyway, um, this is, I, I would say, rapidly becoming the default thing. If you're going to ask me what should I use for the reactive interface, and, and I wasn't trying to sell you Sky, I would say the KMP native coroutines, uh, coroutines of course. Um, you know, it is, it is a good piece of open source tooling, and you should definitely use that. Uh, there are differences. You know, the, they're not, he's not generating Swift, and, you know, we're generating Swift, and we can be more type safe across the border. We can do some other things. The stuff we can add over time. Again, Taddeus will explain better uh, the exact differences, but it's cool. But if that's all we did, I would say that would be a tough sell. Um, the Mocha case with, of course. I think other people are like, well, what about Mocha case with? I'm like, this is where you get in a weird area. They're also a consulting company. I don't want to seem like I'm being throwing shade or whatever that is. But, um, and they're great. They do a lot of good stuff for the community. However, this generates sealed classes, some support, and that's it in Swift in a separate package. That's number one. Number two, the model. Well, I think it does something else, but I, nothing I would use. And the model is like a plugin model. And so you can add your own thing. It's like, oh, great. So I can make data classes into structs. Like, cool. Except that if you're like, you know, if your data class is part of the sealed class and now it's making a struct, but it doesn't know that you're doing something weird with the sealed class. And now these things are competing with each other. And then that's two things. And multiply that by like five more. So, and then try to test it with KMP native coroutines. It doesn't also know that you're completely changing the interface that it expects. This is where this gets very complicated. Complexity growth is not linear with this kind of thing. So it is, it is a tool that you should try. And I would say that this is more tolerable with small teams who are willing to work around the interface issues. As teams get larger, it becomes more of a problem where people are like, this just does not work. I'm getting a crash, WTF, and, and that kind of falls apart. So like the goal of what we're trying to do is make a tool that is like, this is going to work in your larger org. Again, this is a talk about teams. If you're an individual, what I say, you, you know, you should do this, I don't know. But we're also, I mean, the licensing is probably going to be consumptive-based, so there might just be free, I don't know. Don't even, sorry, Jeff, don't quote me on that. Um, we'll see how that goes. So, uh, presenting, oh, by the way, the QR code will be up at the end, of course, because 
That's what you got to do. Presenting to a team. Um, and when I say that, I mean presenting to an iOS team, because I will tell you, presenting to the Android team is not good practice. They tend to not mind this idea so much. Um, I would say, we always say this, start with empathy, right? So sometimes the problems that are brought up feel reflexive. That is true. But sometimes, and sometimes they are kind of reflexive, but most of the time there is healthy skepticism about these technologies. Because we've all seen bad versions of these technologies, and it is not unhealthy to think that there's, this is another one at first, right? And I would say, I hear Android devs are like, oh, Apple devs will never go for this, as if Apple devs are less open to new things and closed-minded. And I have to remind people, like, well, how do you think the web devs feel when you're like, no way, get out of here with React Native? They think that you're closed-minded. Everyone has to keep in mind that we're all people and, and, and people stuff's the hard stuff, right? Um, the problems that they bring up are actual problems. Don't dismiss them out of hand, right? Like, I, at the beginning, I too was like, oh, Swift and Objective-C, they're not that different, you could deal with it. And when you get in the weeds, you're like, no, it sucks. Like, it, it can really suck, and it can, it can, it can kind of suck, or it can suck real bad, depending on how you do it. So, the other thing I tell people is, you know, accept that you may not succeed. Um, somebody yesterday, and then other people in the past, basically frame it as, how do I win that discussion? And I'm like, well, number one, it's not a contest. And number two, you may not. And if you go in with, I have to get this discussion, it's going to get tense real fast. So I would just say, don't do that. Um, understand the issues and be prepared to address them. For example, how much binary is this framework going to add? I don't know. Well, that, that's going to be a problem. Like, you kind of have to, like, be prepared to understand and address issues. Like, you have to understand that it is Objective-C, but we're going, to, we're going to avoid sealed classes and do this for now. Like, okay, you know, you have to be able to answer those questions, and, and you, questions you will certainly get. I say you, I mean the collective you, you know, not everybody, I don't know. All right, so um, start with a module again, mode one, SDK flow. Introduce Kotlin in a way that doesn't interrupt somebody's day, if at all possible. Now, what module? We've been saying this for years. Pick something, and this kind of came from Jesse Wilson, uh, and he's got a lot of good advice about this, so, so check out what he says. Pick something nobody wants. Like, no developers love uh, analytics, unless you have an analytics startup, I guess. Um, analytics is no joy. All you can do is screw it up. It's a bag of strings that might have the wrong case, blah, blah, blah. If you make a typed analytics library, give it to the Android team, give it to the iOS team, just say, hey, call this thing. Don't worry about it. Usually goes all right. I haven't met a lot of iOS developers who love core data, maybe a couple, maybe you write some database stuff. I would suggest SQL Delight. We wrote the driver, it's pretty cool. Anyway, um, find an ally, somebody like, again, you know, some developers don't wanna hear any of this new stuff, but there's almost always someone who's curious and wants to try new stuff out. And getting help from someone who understands the iOS ecosystem in general and understands the app you're working on in particular is an important thing and you should attempt to do that. Um, if you don't have that, it's going to be rather difficult, I would say, in cases where the team is relatively large, unless everyone loves you for some reason. I don't know. Um, people stuff is hard. You know, I had that question, like, live panel, everyone's like, what do you think is more difficult, the technical stuff or the people stuff? And everyone across the board was like, people stuff. It's organizations. You have to, like, take care to, to, to be kind to people. Don't offend them. Like, you know, not everyone's got the same ideas. Don't go in there, like, and just wreck and shot, that kind of thing. Not that you would. I'm sure you're all wonderful people. Um, other stuff, quickly, because I'm running out of time. Modularization, one framework, one namespace. Uh, can we have multiple frameworks? Sure, but they can't talk to each other. The namespace thing becomes a problem. As this gets bigger and bigger, this becomes more of a problem and it does not scale well. Um, what happens when you have a thing called adapter and adapter? Well, one of them gets an underscore. Which one? Who knows? You can find out. You gotta look at it, though. Uh, what happens if you get another thing named adapter? So you want to guess? Uh, I don't have time. You get another underscore. So um, again, there is this Objective C name thing that is brand new with 1.8. Uh, again, it's Rick. Thank you, Rick, for doing that. Please take a day off. You're making us look bad. <laughs> nah, he's doing great work. I'm surprised he's not here. Um, Anyway, so you still need uh, multiple frameworks, name spaces, but I've heard positive things at this very conference. Formal SPM support, very much we need it. Uh, best practices for shared code. So like that whole, how do you solve with two different teams editing the same shared code? Like, I don't know if that's a tech problem. That's probably just an organizational problem. And there's best practices that'll emerge. Or it just is like back end and front end. It's always a module. Like, I don't know. Depends on your thing. And there's a bunch of ongoing quality of life issues that I won't list here now because we're running out of time. Um, but I try to remind people because I give a lot of talks and they're like, wow, 
I think you unsold me on KMP because all you talked about was the problems. And I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to get past the problems. But the forest for the trees, it's amazing tech. I think it is the future, at least for folks who are gonna do it. Uh, just don't, don't get afraid of it. So the future, uh, this is a very easy one. Go watch the keynote because all the shit that I like about the future is pretty much discussed in there. Wasm and Compose Web, awesome, it's gonna be great. Wasm on the server, gonna be great. Wasm needs a default language. I love Rust, but I like coding in Kotlin better for day-to-day -day stuff. And who gets to be the default language? I don't know, but let's see what we can do. Um, Compose UI and optionally shared UI, obviously, we're loving this stuff. Uh, this one's a little more controversial. A really open web, no offense to the open web, but if you're not in one of the groups that get to vote on stuff, I don't open this. I want a sandbox container instead of a quirky JS-only API if we can ga gosh darn get it. And I think that that's gonna happen at some point, not to diss on the open web, it's great. Otherwise, it would be Microsoft web. Um, Simply better ways to build and deliver products. The future recap, different teams, Cambridge, Option UI, Sky, Future loves Kotlin, and there's your QR code. At the buzzer. <laughs>